Well, welcome team. We are in week three, not week two. So just ignore that and look at the pretty picture. Yeah, and here's how we turned out. So All Blues Life West was a close game, which is awesome and good for the league. Andrew Stockton put up more points than I've seen in a WPL match in quite some time. So I'm looking forward to hearing him tell us about how those sprint trials went and what the numbers on his GPS was. And then New York uh, rolled over Orsu pretty good. But honestly, if you haven't looked at that one, the video is really good. Um, and it's nice to watch Tim. He's got a good feel for what to play through. So if you get a chance, that's worth some of your time. Tim, are you on? We're going to let Tim go first because he has another call or he's got something he's involved in this evening. I got a, I got a science night that I have to be at, but I'm here. Awesome. So the way we've kind of been running through this is just go ahead and lead in. You're familiar with the D1A process, so pretty similar. Give us a little chat about your goals, process around game prep or something that you're working in development this season with your coach and trends from the match that we need to be aware of and we'll go through your clips. Yeah, um, so I guess in general, um, I've been working on scrums and kind of set piece, line out, just being a little more precise and deliberate and slow. Um, that's kind of my overarching season goal that I've been working on. Um, I didn't get a good chance to really wrap my head around this game because I kind of got a late ad, but I did, um, you know, I did a little research and uh, I was worried about Orsu causing issues in the scrum. And then I knew that um, New York would have the ability to kind of score kind of quickly with their outside backs. And so those are just kind of things that went into the game. Um, the game was a five o'clock game on Saturday. Uh, New York had been traveling all day, um, but it was good conditions. I got to Portland and it had been raining like all week and they basically said they had one day of sun. So it was nice to be able to run and have a kind of a dry game. Cool, and I should have introduced um... Emily picked up an injury, and so Tim stepped in for us real quick, and he just did an excellent job. So everybody, welcome to Tim, and lots of thanks to him. Yep. Good sure. to see you again, Tim. Nice, seeing, nice hearing you again, Peter. Should we head over to the clips, or is there anything from the stats worth taking? Um, yeah, maybe, maybe let Lee, um, Lee and I talked a couple times um, sporadically, but if, Lee, do you have anything you want to chat about? Maybe trends in the game or going into the game or anything from your side? Um, yep, sorry, can you hear me? Yep, we got you. Okay, yeah, so this is a, kind of a quintessential WPL matchup. You have Orsu, who is normally like a stronger pack, and then you have New York, who usually uh, does pretty good on the outside, and um, you know, and so because of that, like Orsu was doing everything in their power to slow the game down um, in the breakdown. Um, but yeah, I, I mean, there's some learning points in this game, but um, it was also nice to talk to Tim because he'd been, he said he was working so hard to like not get too amped and, and too reactive. And I, I think um, it really showed his progress on this game. So that was kind of neat. Um, but uh yeah, it was uh, actually really fun to watch, so. Okay, so where should we start from the clips? Um, uh, let me just talk about kind of two overall big trends and then the clips, and then we can go into some other stuff. Super. Um, but, you know, one thing that, um, you know, Lee kind of talked to me and I recognize myself and I kind of beat myself up as a little bit in the middle of the second half is that, you know, I tend to play through things and kind of play on and really try to manage out of stuff. And, um, you know, at the, ex well, for continuity, but at the expense of maybe setting a standard. And so that was, a, you know, something that I think I kind of keep in my head and maybe, maybe just work on in general is I tend to, I value continuity over a standard. And then you can see the middle of the second half, my st the standard kind of gets broken down a little bit. And then I have to kind of claw back and, you know, give a card and players a little frustrated at the end. And so, you know, in a, in a tighter match, that would have kind of caught up with me. Um, so that's one thing. And then the other thing was, you know, in this game, I recognized very quickly that Orsu was dominating a scrum. 
but I couldn't find opportunities to reward them in the moment. But then when watching, going back and watching, you know, I recognized there was at least two or three scrums I could have easily pinged New York for standing up or breaking off early. And I didn't recognize those, but in my head, I was like trying to find things to um, do to give Orsu the advantage or give them the opportunity to reward them. And so those are two things that I left the game being like, how did I, how do I do that? And so those are what my clips are kind of around. Great. Where do you want to start? So, yeah, we'll start with a uh, 13. There's like um, yep, 13 no. kind of in the way. Or this is an interesting yeah. one. Okay, and we're going to have to bear with me because I cannot explode my screen right now in advantage. Let's see. All right, did everybody see that? Let's see it again. Yep. You can, you can see me like like pulling people out and like talking to people, and then thirteen's just in the channel, and I'm like trying to get her out, and I'm trying to play on, but I think this was just a clear opportunity. I should have pinged thirteen for being right there. I didn't. I played on, and you know, again, this is this is an opportunity where I I should have maybe set a better standard and not just played through because thirteen didn't learn from that. I didn't reinforce any behavior there yep. lazy runner um, and on the ground you see she landed on the wrong side of the ruck slowed down the ball coming out and the lazy runner i mean there's a ton of things i could have could you have done something to like tell her to stay down i think he does did you she stays down though she's right she's, here she's you know she yeah. interferes with the nine yeah Anyone have other suggestions for how to handle this one? Tim went and played through it. I, I think that should have been a, uh, a quicker call at that point. They, she's already accomplished, even whether she wanted to or not, she already accomplished a fastball, right? I mean, and the way she pulled out just didn't, I think Tim got it, right? He understands what he was looking at, so. Can we hear from a referee? Tim, it's, it's uh, Andrew. Um, I'm just curious what the ultimate outcome ended up being. Did Orsu score off of this? Great question. Or, Orsu did. But Orsu did. Um, they were able to, to score off this, and the game was close at this point. It was um, 20 minutes. The first 20 minutes of the game was very close and very good, and then um, New York scored like three tries in five minutes, and that's where the game kind of changed rapidly momentum very much changed and the game changed after that what do you think andrew i think i mean you're what 10 15 meters out from the try line might be nice to just play an advantage here um because i think i think a penalty honestly just kind of slows the game down needlessly i like that you play away from this honestly but i think a, an advantage probably does better here because then you've got something in your back pocket give a little bit of time for Oregon to do whatever with it. Um, and then if they end up scoring, great. You can just say, look, you need to move faster. In retrospect, 13 was a problem. She was offside a couple more times. She ended up on the wrong side of the rock and I, you know, pinged her a couple times and I gave her a warning, but you know, this maybe would have changed things. Maybe, I don't know. So I love how you tried to keep her out of it and then I would have liked to see an advantage played. It, I think it did ultimately work out for you playing through it because I think Orsu did score, if I recall. So awesome, great clip, good conversation. Anybody have any last thoughts on this one? It was interesting too, because, um, and I don't know if they're related, but later in the game, then Orsu had like lazy runners that affected New York's play. So it was, it was definitely a thing in this match. Yeah, I wonder if that's a fitness thing. It was a it was a warm day. It was a hot day. So uh, let's go to the scrum clip next. If if that's if we want to move on, I okay. Talk about it more if you want to. Yeah, I, I think we're ready to move on. Anybody have anything else? Cool. The scrum one's pretty good too. So yeah, this is you know well well into the game, and um, Orsu had been dominating almost every scrum 
And in my mind, I was like, I need to, I need to give Orsu a, you know, I need to reward them. And this was a very clear one. I should have, you know, on review watching it, you know, New York is under duress. They're standing up. I could have easily pinged them for this, but they don't, they get the ball out, they spin it wide and they, you know, have a pretty good platform after that. So, but the general question is, is, you know, how do you find opportunities to reward those scrum teams? You know, if they're scrumming well, you should give them a reward for, for dominating that piece. And I didn't in this game. Right here, they're all, ah. Any comments for anybody? Yep, can we hear from a referee first, please? We need to see it again. This is a bigger question, you know, when you identified a team as dominating in the in the scrums, how do you reward that team? You know, if you can't find something that's very clear. I think I blew a penalty sometime in the game and I, there was just like nothing really there, but I was like, I need to reward them. So I'm just going to give them the reward. Yeah. You definitely have something clear here. Um, does everyone kind of understand what Tim's getting at with this idea of he wants to reward or sue here? But I'm, but I mean, technically you can't really, I mean, if, if, or, um, if New York stayed flat or sue could push them across the field. And so you couldn't really, Right. Call the penalty until New York like stands up, aka unbind. So I feel like we should be careful how we delineate. It's like, it's not about it's not about rewarding them. It's about when when New York commits a penalty and right. from unstable. Right. Yeah. So, I, yeah. Go ahead. I, I agree with that. I think the nine there does an absolutely fantastic job to just get that ball out as quickly as possible. I think at that stage there, you could say that the ball's still in the scrum, penalize it, but that nine has done a fantastic job to get that ball out of the scrum as quick as possible and get it to the back line. I, I can see why you would penalize it, but at the same time, I can also see why you'd let that play just because the ball's out and, and they're playing rugby. So at this point, if yeah, New York that, had stayed New down, who would have New won York the does, scrum? does do a... New York does do a good job of getting the ball out and then they have regular platforms. So, I mean, they, you know, granted, you're right. They granted, they did, even though the nine was under a lot of pressure, they did get the ball out and everything was fine. So sorry, man, I cut you off. No, no, no. I mean, my question here for the group is had New York stayed in their position and not stood up, who would have won the scrum? And that's the question. Does the standing up mean that a different team wins than if both teams had stayed square and down? Thoughts, referee coaches? Momentum is all with Orsu. So you're in favor of the penalty? Mm -hmm. yeah. I have a different challenge based on how Tim first said presented this okay and this is my challenge to you guys um you guys are all so fantastic at calling the first tackle penalty you see it you ping it you're done you exude confidence but when it comes to the scrum tim you you, you the way you the, the word choice you weren't exuding confidence what is it about the scrum where you don't exude that same confidence you're aware of the pattern you, you've, men, you've mentally stated, I see a pattern here of concern, but I wasn't sure what to do. Why do you have confidence at the tackle? And I'm just, just you know, using that as a simple example versus um, scrum. Why don't you ping the first infringement at the scrum, but you do it at the tackle every time? Yeah, I mean, personally, it's because I'm a, a scrum half. So I'm like, you know, trying to, like my, my handle on the game is a lot more in the loose and kicking and stuff. and 
the scrum feels like. And I've 100% gotten better this year and understanding thing, you know, what they're trying to do and when people are offending and who the biggest offenders are. But yeah, I just am not as, you know, right on about it. It doesn't, I don't have that, um, that ability to just do it. I feel I'm like, I need, I need reassurance, I guess, sometimes of it. Like, is this right? Am I, am I, is this the right thing? This Personal. is a really good clip. Thank you for putting this one in here. Tim, could I ask why you were standing um, on the opposite side of the scrum to where the ball's being fed? Um, I was worried about the loose head of, of Orsu um, coming across. And that was identified in a game before that the loose head of Orsu tends to put an angle on. They, she tends to get her hips out. So that's why I was standing on that side. Um, had they been doing it this game? My only question is, is um, if you're on comms, which I can't really see if you are or not, and you know that New York is putting the ball in and they're under pressure, you know that that nine's priority is getting that ball out as quick as possible. I think from the position you're in, you can't really see if that ball's in or out by the time that New York infringe. And it's just a suggestion, and I get like you watching a billion things, but it's really important to know if that ball's in or out of the scrum because then your confidence may just increase to that. That's an easy penalty suddenly. Yep, great point. Fantastic comment. Any last things on this clip? Olivia, what would be the first thing that you would ping in this clip? I mean, that was Dan, right? I would take it the other way is what doesn't look right to you? Sorry, what is that, is that if everything looks right, then you're fine. But the first thing you would ping is, is I mean, New York clearly stands up um, as they back up. That's probably the easiest call for, what's the easy call for everyone to understand? I think Amanda likes to say that all the time. What's the easy call that has the greatest impact and pattern of play? Yeah, for me, if I'm standing on the sidelines, New York clearly is standing up. I mean, obviously in that picture, they're kind of, they all stand up because they're all worried about, you know, getting run over or, you know, toppled over, so. Yeah, perfect. Um, one thing I had forgotten, we did receive feedback that we should introduce ourselves um, when we are speaking. So just think about that. This is Bob, this is Amanda, this is whatever. So just use your name if you can. Thank you. Let's move on. Amanda, this is Tim. Do you wanna do one more clip or are we good? We are absolutely doing more clips. What else you got for us? Okay. Um, there's one, uh, I think it's the only other clip I have, okay. but it's just one of these funny ones that I, I got in the way. Like I saw it at the moment, the, uh, there's a pass to seven. She's trying to pass inside. I'm standing there. She stops. And then she kind of goes into contact and the ball gets turned over. And I'm like, oh, God, I blocked her. And then now the ball gets turned over. And I'm in this tough situation where I don't, like, I should have maybe, I don't know. I, I didn't know what to do. So I guess show the clip and people can see. Let me know if we need this one slowed down, but I think it's pretty straightforward. There it was. It's, it's, it's right here. Yep. I block her. Yep. And then he doesn't have the support and then it turns over. And in my head, I'm like, oh gosh, I, did I cause that? I think I did. I think it might he be said I did. before it gets turned I, over. I think I did. Yeah. Oh yeah. Well, it eventually gets turned over in that. Yep. Yeah. You can see the poacher was there on that one. This is Haley. Um, I can't tell the speed or not, but the receiver of that pop pass, were they running on to the ball? Like, were yeah. they expecting to get that pass? Yes. I mean, if you look at the clip in kind of regular speed and just the feel of the game, like she, I think she wanted to pass that ball inside and okay. I was there and she's like, oh, that person's there. So I'm going to pull back and then they go into contact and then turnover happens. And then it's, you know, eight seconds later and I can't, I, I feel like I can't blow the penalty 
or blow a referee in the way thing, but maybe I could have. No, no, you couldn't yeah. for law. No. Peter, do you want to explain that to us? No, not at all. You, all. you can only do a referee interference if player with possession runs into the referee. Okay. You ball know, or ball carrier has to hit the ref. Yeah, if, if, if a defender runs into you, that's like, sorry. Yep. So this is basically yeah. a nothing as far as we're concerned. Yeah, I mean... This is this is I'm um, I'm sorry. Yep. Uh, my bad. My bad. Think about more distance from the lateral distance from the piece. I think this is Wendy. You could also look at it. You're running an M line. If you just go straight across, you're not in their way. Yeah, that's what I said. Lateral distance. Okay, then you're smarter than me, Peter. <laughs> <laughs> Are we good? Okay, is that it from you, Tim? Um, yeah, um, unless Lee wants to add anything on additional, but thanks guys. And um, thank you so much, me. we really appreciate you. Lee, anything? No, there's, I mean, there's other good clips from that game. I don't think we need to discuss them here, but there's some really interesting ones in that game that I would recommend everyone look at. Yep. I agree. I enjoyed watching that match. Thank you guys. Okay, so next up, let's see. Um, Hannah, I noticed that you're on the call. So do we want to go to Chris O'Malley's match next? If you don't mind, I also have to leave in about seven or eight minutes because we have training. Perfect. Do you want to go first with what you wanted to discuss or did you want to go ahead? Um, O'Malley is actually on a plane tonight. He's got some work stuff he's traveling for. So he's not with us on this call. Well, um, I mean, I talked to him after the game, so we had a good conversation just about management and everything there. Um, but I did have one at minute about minute twenty eight in okay. our game versus Life West, and I think it actually speaks well to like the positioning that Tim just had as well. Uh, I think part of this for us is like we're playing a pretty hard inside shoulder defense. Uh, when we're coming to, when we're, when we're standing inside of like whatever pod or forward shape that most teams have. So this is at minute 28. Minute. Okay. Um, and I appreciate the clarification actually on this last bit as well, that if a defender runs into you, it's just an, I'm sorry. <laughs> uh, yeah. So it's like 2802, I think. Okay. So I'm sorry. I didn't introduce Hannah for those of you who don't know. She's coaching the All Blues this season. So 2802, we're at 2759 now. Let's see. Yeah, just sort of this is where it sort of starts. So he's in that same sort of positioning that Tim just saw. Mm -hmm. um, and sh she hits that inside runner. So unlike Orsu that doesn't hit that inside runner. So did we just miss it right there? Yeah. Kind of um, like the referee pick. Yeah, and if you want to, our, our number six is the one who in theory like ends up running around Chris okay. to get to this um, simply because of the inside ball. If, if it was a, you know, I think we've got pretty good positioning here and good spacing. And then our six is meant to come up and take that inside player. Um, right there. She hits yeah. him. Yeah. And sort of ends up having to go around him. Yep. So I think, just for us, I don't know how we can manage that a little bit better, just letting the referees know maybe that we're playing an inside shoulder defense in that situation. But I also know I don't want to just like tell everybody our entire game plan. So <laughs> it's not to manage around that, right? Like, yep, absolutely. So and I think I'm not the person that's the... going to tell a player to go belt a referee. To... Yes, correct. And thank you so much. <laughs> I think part of the problem is where he um, executes his pirouette. Sorry, I muted myself and I'm talking to myself over here and it was really brilliant. Um, so I think the problem is where he executes this pirouette. And if he had stepped further towards the defense, he would have been out of the way. Does anybody else yeah. have thoughts on that? Let's try to see again. Yeah. Let's watch it. 
go ahead. Yeah, this is Peter. Um, as much as I dislike the referee stepping into the D line, this was one spot where, at once the ball was cleanly won, a, a qu last minute step through would have gotten him out of the way. Yep, one step forward, and he's out of the way. Yeah, I think. Exactly. Anything further on that, Peter? No, no, that okay. that was it. That's you know, I I am generally not in favor of that, but uh, yeah. So Hannah, that may be the thing. If you notice it in a match, just have the captain um, say, sir, you're in the way of our defense. Do you mind taking a step forward into the defense when we come forward? Something like that um, in a polite way might help. Did you notice it more than just this one time in the match, I'm assuming? Yeah, I mean, I think it's it's probably consistently going to be the case, it sounds like now, with the way referees are being coached for positioning in this, and this is going to be a commonality. So I think it, it initially makes it harder for our alignment to be able to align properly and then be able to shift once that's out. So as long as, yeah, a referee can step sort of across that and open up and get out of that defensive line as we're advancing. So see how flat he is here? Like technically he should be more back here, like at the 45, right? And then he wouldn't have been in the way. But then once he advances forward, which is sort of what we do to push the, um, defense back then he needed to take the extra step in so he wasn't in the way so I think it's not something you should run into all of the time with refs I think it's something that's going to happen sometimes and we will try to avoid it does that make sense yeah I mean I guess like sorry one last point is sort of thinking about this like this uh -huh. works really well for teams that blitz um and I think this is like this sort of positioning has been framed around like teams that blitz that are always coming outside shoulder and in this framing really works well for, but it makes it really hard for teams that are going to press up and out. Um, just most of the time, if they, if they do want to use that inside ball, because they'd use that inside ball if we're not pressing from the inside as much as we should in this case. So um, that's just neither here or there, but sort of a statement that I think like, in general, uh, we can adapt to, and I'll like try and get everybody to adapt to that and just mention it to their referees ahead of time. Before yeah, the game. I, th I think for the most part, they shouldn't be in the way. And if it's happening repeatedly with the ref, then we're going to need to look at their timing. Does that awesome. seem? Yeah, awesome. Thank you. Yep. Yeah, thank I you. think that was like the only thing that I noticed consistently that like interrupted our sort of structure and pattern of play. Um, okay. Otherwise, it was pretty even throughout, right? Like we sort of talked about his, his breakdown is very quick in a lot of ways, but it was even for both sides. Um, and it would have been beneficial for the offsides line to have the ARs, the mics working. That was, that was a little bit of a hindrance, but otherwise, um, all in all, pretty, pretty even throughout. Okay, and I'll look into the mics too and figure out what happened there. I think uh, it was just pinched. I think he like got it figured out five minutes from the end, but yeah. Okay. Cool. Well, we really appreciate. But thank you, you all. Being here. No, thank you all was... for listening and allowing, <laughs> allowing combo. Always want to hear from you. Yeah. No, that was really great feedback. Thank you very much. Um, this is Haley. Hannah. I would say that um, this scenario is like every. I mean referees uh, worst nightmare it's not something we enjoy with that pop back inside and being I mean it it is you feel the weight when you know you block that defender coming in from your inside shoulder um, but I think just like Olivia mentioned that at the beginning um, uh, when they do the pre-match chat just talking to referees um, you know we take that inside shoulder if you just are mindful of that um, usually that'll clear it up and we'll run more of a hard ball line run rather than um, a flat line to, so that you have that, um, that space that's coming right near the, off the, off the, the rock. So thank you all appreciate it. Thank you. Wendy, what else from this match? Yeah, we talked about a couple of things. Chris continues to work on letting the breakdown breathe. And I think we saw a little bit of progress there. I think tactics, um, tools that Chris and I talked about before the match are seeing the infraction at the penalty, filing it away for a second. So literally like, cool, that player maybe didn't roll away. I'm going to see what happens. 
if the ball is quick, let's let's move on. The ball is slow, then let's make a decision. And I think that helped a little bit. Um, I, I've tagged some cases for Chris where I think he did well, and I put one in the clips there. There's still room for improvement. And so then we I tried to reframe the conversation because he has often been told he's just too technical at the breakdown. So I tried to change the words because I was also told that as a referee. So I went with Mark Nelson's minnows and whales. So minnows are tiny little fish. Whales are obviously huge. So every breakdown, there's going to be a penalty. Leave the minnows, let them grow, right? They're off sides, whatever, tackle, side entry, who cares? The ball came out, we play on. We want to go for whales. That player impacted play. They caused a big thing. Let's call that, right? So, and I think that helped him. He hadn't had that uh, before. So I think that was helpful. Um, so that was one big thing. And then I think the second thing came in the second half. Um, it was a very unbalanced second half with Life West getting a lot of penalties. And Chris did try to have a chat. Um, it was ineffective and probably the wrong time. So the wrong impact happened. And it was too late. He, he should have been giving a card instead of having a chat. Um, so couldn't necessarily tag all of those. But if you want to go watch like the 75th minute till the end, you'll see there's like a terror of penalties against Life West. And they are not contrite. <laughs> okay. Let's take a look at these clips. Which one first? I think let's start with a positive. So good communication. And the film is, it's too far away. It's, it's hard. So he's in there. The player uh, was a poacher. And he, you can tell he got body language was in there. And then this leads to a try instead of blowing it up. Yeah. And she Which probably really would. Nice. She, and she probably would have preferred to give the penalty. I don't know. This is too far away to really see what was going on in the breakdown. So. No. I could see the, the blue players over it and and he mm -hmm. goes in there and and I don't know if he actually pats her, but he right on in and and all of a sudden she's standing up and walking and, and leaving it alone. Yeah, this his whole body language immediately in he's almost wagging his finger and then he stands up because he's satisfied that she's done what he said is is how it feels to me, but yeah, okay. the film is hard. I, I agree, Wendy. This one, I think this is a good play on, but I just wanted to get the group's perspective to see if I'm off base or. You might have to play it a couple times. Yeah, because yeah, it's quick. Play it in slow if I can. There we go. So here we have tackle. Looks like she releases, sets the ball, and goes on again. Mm -hmm. Probably. Yeah, I mean, it's, again, hard to tell, but it looks, I mean, I'm okay with it. Everybody, anybody not okay with it? I'll just ask us to clarify the standard for where the ball carrier, like if they place the ball at their feet, can they get up and pick it up behind them? Or does it need to be in front of like their center of gravity or where that line is? Are you talking about uh, Dennis Haley? You're talking more about for like the ball carrier or if there's a rock in the front most person in the rock taking it? Ball carrier. Yeah. Ball carrier's got pretty free license. Yeah. Everybody else has restrictions. Okay. I've, I've, I'll uh, reorient myself. The standard I, that has been explained to me is if somebody puts the ball at their feet and their chest is, say, like a yard and, or a meter in front, if they get up and they don't retreat or collect behind the ball, you can't let them pick it up and play on. So I can, I can change that standard, but that's something, that's an assumption that I have. 
All right. I'm just trying. thank you. Okay. And then these are harder to clip, but if you'll do communication first, this is the 17th minute of the game. And it's in there somewhere. It's just communication, just one word. Maybe it didn't. You might have to refresh. I just put them in. Oh, okay. Uh, yeah, that's probably yeah, was, what it is. Yeah, I was like, I just put them in. Yeah, do communication first. So this is an opportunity. He, he whistles off and wants to chat with teams, but he chats with both when Life West is up five penalties to three. So it's really like ineffective. Like you, you might as well not do it in my opinion. Okay, are we gonna see much from the video? Not really. I mean, it's just, yeah, these are hard to tag. It's more yeah. of a philosophical discussion. And it's, and it's like a tackler not rolling penalty. So it's just like a, that's not what the repeated pet infringements have been. So it's just kind of like, Let's use time to chat with the play. Like, let's let's talk to the offending team, not both of them. I would be my preference. Agree. And then the next one, we can just you know you don't have to play it. I get it's the same thing. This is where it's like at the 80th minute, and Life West has been penalized six times in a row. So he does chat, but in my opinion, we should have already been working towards a card. So it's just that those recognition of trends and, and how you recognize those things. And this is three inside the red zone. So it's the right time to chat, but you've had three before. So it's just, you need to recognize those. So this was a situation where he should have just carded and not be having. He should have carded. Yeah. And, and then Berkeley has a chance to maybe catch up more. Mm -hmm. So big decisions. Yep balance probably too okay awesome thank you so much wendy appreciate you pulling those clips out and doing that um for us and we're ready to move on andrew and rosalind anderson sweet um yeah so we had a great time out in colorado um bit windy on the day uh which was not the norm for the week um i flew into colorado on wednesday and was up visiting a friend um so i was definitely acclimated to the altitude which was very nice um especially in a high scoring game like this if, if i had to come in day of or day before um, i can definitely tell you that i would have been sucking a bit of wind there at the end um but i got a couple of sprint sessions in the days before so i was feeling really good um for most of my season, kind of the two big things I've been focusing on um, is number one, really trying to parse out around breakdown in, in specific, kind of what I can and can live without as far as penalties go. Um, I had a game with Cal and Central Washington, which had a, a pretty high penalty count. Um, and that really was like, hey, we've got to get our picture under control and find out can we really live with some stuff and can we really live without some stuff? Um, and over the last, I'd say five to six weeks, I've really worked really hard on that. Um, and I think you can see that reflected in, in our final total here. Um, there's actually one more, it should be 17 because the first three minutes of the video are gone. Um, but I think overall, I was extremely happy with, um, with the way breakdown went. Um, and then the second, uh, thing I've been working on pretty heavily is line out. Um, and that wasn't as big of a factor in this game as I was thinking it might be. Um, so, you know, those are kind of where my focus areas have been. Um, in the game going into it, I had a pretty strong feeling that Colorado was going to roll here. Uh, they performed very well against Orsu, uh, as, I, as we all saw with Haley's game a couple of weeks ago. Um, and then last week with Marty's game versus uh, New York, um, Twin Cities definitely had a little bit of, of rust and some kinks to work out. Um, so I originally thought that this was kind of going to be one way traffic the entire game. And I was pleasantly surprised um, that the first half was extremely competitive. Uh, we went into half at 30 to 22. And honestly, Amazon's had the entire momentum of the game. Um, but once that second half hit, it was pretty clear that um, both the conditioning and the uh, connection between the Grey Wolves players was much stronger. Um, and they just put three tries on Amazon in first five minutes of the second half, and that was kind of game. Um, as far as overall trends, not too much. Um, 
as Amazon gets hired, they start to become pretty lazy around their offside, uh, which is a pretty normal thing to happen. Um, the places you'll probably notice it the most is on their pillar post. They will start creeping, um, but they are pretty responsive and that's something you can push them back on. Um, and that's something I was able to play away from quite a few times to just push them back, especially given that Colorado was making so much, um, so much ground. Um, yeah. Um, let's see, I think there was one more thing I wanted to add. Um, it slips my mind right now, but I will, I'm sure it'll, it'll come back to me. Um, briefly about the penalty count. So you said 16 should have been 17. Did you identify any penalties that you should have awarded that you didn't, or for the most part, do you think this was so actually there's a cut there's one um one of my clips is a penalty that we probably should have awarded um and there's also a couple in here that uh not clips but a couple of ones where i should have i could have done without it um looking back on it and in our discussion with Roz, we both think yeah you probably could have gotten away without doing that um so okay. you can actually see one right there player yeah, offside no, shuts one. down a lot of space and i think yeah. there were two of those um so you know, those will, um, those are definitely ones to, to look back on. Okay. Um, yeah. Awesome. Uh, yeah. Oh, Rosalind? that's what I wanted to add. Um, yep. yeah. If you are going to have, um, gray wolves or, or the Zons, um, players to watch out for, for sure. Gray wolves, their number nine is absolutely phenomenal. Um, and I think it's the numbers three and number five and six for gray wolves are just world are just really world class they're really tough competitors um work really hard around the breakdown especially their number five uh that player is always pillar post and makes first contact probably 60 70 percent of the time um they made a huge impact and then for zons their captain kj uh played in the olympics and it clearly shows um game anticipation work rate was insane um i remember they went to take a kick at goal and said something along the lines of like, oh, I am so out of shape, blah, blah, blah. And I was genuinely shocked because uh, you could not tell. And then um, the number 14 for Zons as well, all over the place, big hits, really aggressive runner. So just keep your eyes on, on those players, I would say. Um, as far as clips, um, let's start off with the last one, the foul play one, if we can. Um, so just for some context, uh, Amazons had just been scored on. Um, they're going for their kickoff here. And you're going to watch the arriving player um, in the bottom right corner, the closest one to the line. Uh, they'll make a jump just as this player comes across and makes contact uh, with that player coming across. Kind of in a weird spot. Um, so I'm curious on the group's thoughts on this. Live, I did not give this a penalty, but I think in review, uh, it's likely that this is foul play here. Um, definitely kind of makes dangerous contact there from a, a player who's not really in a position to um to anticipate contact like that okay can you just tell me which player you think would have committed the foul play is it uh, the, jump, the player jumping the arriving jumper from zons okay Yes, this is Haley. So it's almost like she's hurdling the player, right? So um, both of the white, they all stay like they all stay on their feet, and orange is when the contestant in the air to chose to take that space. So all the players on the ground are, in my opinion, all the players on the ground are fine because they're choosing to defend that spot. Um, so. My first instinct is to like think that the person on the ground also could be penalized because she wasn't taking care of the person that was going in the air, but she never left the ground. So she's not liable for sanction. Whereas I think just orange is essentially hurdling um, and, and not being careful of like her body placement. This is my first instinct. Okay. Thank you. Sound thoughts. Anybody else? Yeah, hi everyone. This is Martin, uh, Marty, uh, whichever. Um, I think White's uh, retreating player, I can't really see the number, but uh, I think that's five, actively gets in the way of Orange there too. Um, I don't know if there's enough that stops Orange from competing at that ball, but I feel like White is actively trying to 
box out for a lack of a better term connecting it to basketball yeah no yeah that's a reasonable thought anybody think this is just rugby contact and we can play through it like andrew chose to do on the day this is wendy wendy go ahead yeah i I'm having a hard time with this one. That it's not a clear, and it feels harsh. But I agree that it's it's um it's it's worth looking at. But I I think it's a play on. Okay, Brian. I think um I don't know how I muted myself, but um oh. <laughs> now that I'm here, uh I I think it seems like poor communication from Colorado. Um, that player is going for the ball play on it's awkward contact but you can do without really hurting anyone there they've all got their eyes on the ball and yeah, I number think... go ahead sorry number five should listen to whoever's yelling mine <laughs> um i guess the first question is is everyone in a realistic position to catch the ball right if we go through our process and to me i think i get to yes who else wants to weigh in? I'm perfectly happy to be wrong. If we were going to award a penalty, what would it be? Like hurdling, playing the man? It's not hitting in the air, right? The player's on the ground. Just like general dangerous play um, is probably what it would be. Rosalind, you were the ref coach on this. What are your thoughts? Well, I said when I saw, was watching the game, I thought that, I mean, I see the logic behind playing on, but I did expect a penalty there. I thought he was going to penalize Orange because she kind of jumps into the other players. But when we were talking about it, we did say, well, let's see what other people think about that. Because, you know, I didn't think it was like horrifying that he didn't penalize, but I did expect a penalty there. Okay. But, you know, maybe it's just like you said, rugby, rugby contact. I, I think we've arrived at one of those clips where if you show it to 10 people, you get 12 different answers. Um, and in those situations, I feel like there's nothing clear and it's probably best to play on. Uh, anybody else want to weigh in? Anybody have a definite answer and anybody not happy with playing on here? I, I have one question, I guess. Would, um, this is Haley, would, uh, would it change anything if it was off of kickoff? And I know that I know I only bring that up because I I think on kickoffs we get so we concentrate so much about that contest in the air and if we did enough like it did did white do enough to keep I don't know I, I did did orange do enough to not reel in a penalty for a dangerous play there um, and I think on kickoffs I I would be really um, more heightened to a penalty, but I guess in general play, we are seem, seem to be more lenient um, in some ways. Yeah. Peter, Jamie, last words? Um, I'm leaning towards penalty against the Zons for the jumper, but I'm also having a chat with White Five about obstruction. Okay. And, you know, just the, the dangerous play outweighs the obstruction. Do you think she was actively obstructing? Because I just don't see her look at orange, which, of course, doesn't need to be taken into consideration. From so her, per, from her perspective, from where is orange going to be coming from? Yeah, it's directly behind her. So, but yeah, doesn't really need to be taken and into she, account. And she's carefully lined up in front of whoever is likely to catch the ball. That's true. But did she get taken out of the play because of the, the collision? Like, she looks like she's going for the ball. Yes, yeah, she does. She's going for the ball. And, and actually, did she, was she the one that got the ball? Okay. I mean, yeah. I'm happy with the penalty against Orange. Yeah, it's that's dangerous, regardless of the reasons that it happened. Okay. Decision made. Good job, team. Awesome. That's... That's what I was looking for. Um, okay, uh, let's do the 
uh, knock on next, the first clip. Um, so again, live, um, I thought that this was just a scrum only knock on. Um, you'll see the outside most Amazon's player, that's their captain KJ, um, shoot up and is in a really, really dangerous position to make an intercept and go through the line. Um, this is the second time in the game that they'd done this. Um, they actually made an intercept and made a pretty good line break uh, early on. But the problem here is this time it's one arm and the ball hits her roughly in, in their bicep. Um, so I'm curious what the group sees here and if this is an intentional, are we going to go just penalty or do we think this is more? Because I think if this is more, or excuse me, I think if this is penalty, there's at least a two or maybe a three on one overlap for Colorado in the second half where they're already making lots of ground. Um, so I'm curious what the group's thoughts are. Okay, so uh, the first question is, is it a knock on? Ninety eight of the percent of the people watching this game are going to say what? Knock on or Dan? Yeah, I think so. Okay. So if it is a knock on, then do we call it intentional and do we have an overload? I'd vote yes, intentional. I think there is an overload. My gut would say penalty only. Okay. Can we say penalty only if there was an overload? What did we agree we were doing preseason? And last week. If it interferes with a line break, we're to, at yellow card. Got it. Discussion, thoughts? Are we not going to take field position into account for that? <clears throat> I'm not saying they couldn't break far, but. Yeah, if that happened inside the 22, it's a potential penalty try. Totally, absolutely, in the 22, but in this field position, would we give that a yellow card? We haven't well, decided that it was intentional yet, but. Is, is anyone seeing an upward motion with the hand? And, and does, that, does that influence your, oh, sorry, this is Jenny. Does that influence your thinking? Does it matter one, when we Go ahead. Jamie here. Yeah, I'm, I'm with Amanda there. I'm not sure that that is the issue that we're really looking at. We're, we're looking at was the person who attempted to play the ball in a realistic position to regather it. That's the standard. Mm. And this is pretty close to that, I would think, because it almost bobbles around in the right hand for a little bit, in which case you can just call out a knock on and play a scrum. Um, yeah, that, that was know, kind uh, of what I was, was getting at. Yeah. yeah, so I mean, yeah, go ahead, Jamie. I to totally agree, um, Jenny. I think that's my experience in the past has been you know, the player knocking the ball up is one thing, the player knocking the ball down is another. But World Rugby have changed their their laws to you know make it more difficult for everyone. So, I, I just think it's it's if we think about it from that perspective, was that was that player in a realistic position to regather that that ball? Um, and this is pretty close, I think. To the other point, once you've decided that it is an intentional knock-on and you're going to penalize, in this case, you've got a three on zero overlap here. I think that that's going to be a line break. You'd have to go yellow card. So mm. you've got a decision here between a yellow card and a, and a scrum. That's my feeling. Interesting. I think that's a fantastic assessment. Interesting. 
So we don't care about the, the, the other player coming in on the left of the screen. That's okay. Oh, Just where? There, left of the, there's, there's a Brown defense. 50 meter line. Left. Yeah. This person? Yeah, yeah that, that makes That's it a three line on break. one. That's still, okay. Yeah, gotcha. it doesn't matter. She's so far away that no matter what, this is a line break, right? Got you. All right, because it, it, well, that was part of our discussion because there are a bunch yeah. of times when the Amazons were able to mobilize their defense and stop this. And then there were a couple of times when the Grace broke through. So anyway, yeah. I just, yeah, live, I just have to say, this was one of those things where, you know, uh, Andrew chose the scrum. And then when I saw it live, I thought, yeah, scrum. But then when we started watching the clip, then we started like picking it apart and thinking, oh, was it intentional? So I did the opposite because I watched it and I was like, oh, yellow card. And then I watched it again and again and again. And I was like, oh, OK, maybe she could have regathered. So my gut was yellow card. See, I think I this like, one cusp. It's just on yeah. the cusp. Because I feel like yellow card. I don't know. I just that's yep, I, you better go through your process. I think recalibrate my brain. Yeah, recalibrate my brain because I just would have felt like, really? Yellow card. It's OK. But, you process. Yeah. Can, are they in a realistic position to regather? Was there a line break? Right. And depending on how you answer those questions, that's how you get to your answer. So, Andrew would have gotten the yellow card. Yep. Good job, Andrew. Well, um, on the day he got to scrum, and as long yeah. as he can explain why in words and terms that make sense to the players, and as long as there was another decision that was like this and he made it the same way, then we're all going to have a happy day. So, that's it. Well, what I mean by that was, that was his thing. His was like, oh, then if it were intentional, then it would be a line break and that would be a yellow yep. card. So what I'm Absolutely. saying is Andrew had the process right. Cool. Yeah. Well done, great clip. Awesome. Um, okay, and then this last one uh, is just kind of a weird little situation um, that on the day, I think we got right, um, but the timing is weird, and I'm curious if there is uh, any input as to whether or not this is play on or not. Oops, there goes my lights. Um, so what will end up happening is this line break happens, and the tackle is made, and the arriving player and the number nine to pick the ball get there almost simultaneously. Um, so you can see ball is placed. There's the arriving player and the nine already has the ball and is going and then makes gets tackled from behind. And so my instinct was, well, that tackle is coming from behind the ruck. That's offside. Um, but what I wanted to see again was, OK, well, does the nine pick the ball up before that ruck is formed? And in that case, do we have play on? And is this wrong? So I'm curious what. Um, anyone's thoughts are, if there's somebody out there more technical than I, who knows, who knows better, um, ignore the fact that I walk way too far back. Uh, Roz and I addressed that the mark should be up where the tackle is made, not outside the 22 where I end up standing. So right there, ruck is formed. Yeah. Okay, that's how I'm processing it, but it's it's grainy, so. And there we've got the tackle. I don't even see the player pick up the ball. Who wants to take a stab at it? Can we just take 13 out of the clip so I can see if it's a rug or not? I mean, that would be helpful. <laughs> Why is she standing in the way? Yeah. What is she doing? <laughs> Anybody? What was the penalty for again? This is Olivia. Uh, I said offside. Um because the player who tackles the number nine comes from behind, is retreating as they should, but ends up making a tackle before they're actually back on side. Yeah, and do the signs look like they're retaining possession? Yes, absolutely. The nine literally has the ball 
Oh, as in, do you mean here? Yes. Interesting point. Honestly, in my head, I didn't even get that far. Somebody has the ball there because it goes flying. Well, did you give a warning here? What was the, the chat like to the players? You know, just, a one -off thing. just a one-off thing and um, just penalized it straight away. So, I mean, it's my thinking, yeah, we, we got a breakaway. The Zons are on the march, hurrah, hurrah. And we've got someone coming in and taking out the nine, killing an attacking player inside the 22. As far as I'm concerned, this is beginning of the second half. Is that correct? I know this is first half still. End of first half? It doesn't really make a difference, I don't think, but I'm at the very least, I would be considering a warning, but yeah, theoretical. I'm I mean, I'm going straight to the pocket if I'm being honest. Like that's that's killed the try, potentially. You got a good point. Look at where the defense is. You you let that nine run through. Nine. It's, it's, you let yeah. that line run through and they got a two on, you know, very good opportunity. Yeah, excellent point, Brad. Okay, I think that's our answer. It's offside and you need to consider the card. Yeah, 100%. I totally didn't even think of that. I appreciate that input, Brian. Good clip. Is that it? Yeah, those are the three that I had. Um, those are those are those are my my controversial three for the uh, for the week. I think. All right. Awesome. Thank you. Great call. Um, so here here are my thoughts for the first three weeks. We need to be careful on the extra rolls with the ball carriers. Um, I am not remembering whose game it was this week because we had two in white and orange, so that confuses my brain. Uh, penalties for not 10 meters. We've had a couple of those if we look across the weeks and a lot of them if we had managed it better or realized what was happening, we can probably get away with not calling the penalty. We should all look at our movement in goal. You guys, the WPL is a fantastic opportunity to see the same speed of rugby week after week. So we need to be practicing the things that we might be weak at. One of those things is movement in goal. Get in, get back out, get in, get back out and do that. Practice it here, it's great. And then finally, um, some thoughts around the games and the balance of the penalty kicks um, from the perspective that if we have an imbalance, it should be a trigger that we need to be thinking about a card. That's really all I have to say about that. Does anyone have thoughts or comments? Otherwise, I'm happy moving on. And this is- I would say, with, oh, Please. sorry, this is Wendy. Just one thing about the movement in goal. I struggle with the get in, get out. I call it bouncing. So I would just, uh, we want to be there for the try but stay with the defense and make sure they're honest and then go in. I do see too much, but it's ping pong and that does not look good. Cool, thank you for that comment. Last thing we need to do, let's take a look at week four. Unfortunately, the Atlanta North Shore game has been postponed. It is not canceled. It is being moved to the week between um, week 10 and finals for now. We'll see what happens. Atlanta does intend to play the rest of the season. Um, Yay. There's, yeah, there's a problem with numbers. They're pulling up life players once life is finished with their season, life season ends this week. So hopefully, fingers crossed, everything will be fine. 
So we do have only three games this coming week. And if I'm not mistaken, we've got two WPL debutants in Dan Frankenfield and Brian Hall. So it'll be awesome to welcome you into the club. So, yep. Thank you so much, everybody. Um, really proud of the group. Everybody's doing great. The communication back from coaches has been very favorable. Yeah, let's get some more coaches on the calls. And Hannah, Hannah was good. Yes, I mean, their, and their feedback is good, you know, but they've got oh. training and that's tough. So ah. they are watching. I can see the numbers of things. So Who needs and I'm training? Questions. So <laughs> awesome. Thanks, team. Go well this weekend, gents. Yep. Bye, everybody. All right, so long. Thank, Thank you all. You. Thank you all. Thanks, everybody.